It's day three of our CES coverage live here in Las Vegas, Nevada, USA. I'm Nikki Gordon Bloomfield. I'm Kate Walton Elliott. And we have been seeing what the world is going to be offering us in the world of cleaner, greener, safer, and smarter transportation in the next couple of years. CES as a trade show is the place where you see trends that are coming to the market a couple of years down the line. And today is the first day we've actually been out on the show floor seeing the things that the vendors have to offer. And there's been a lot of interesting things going on. We've seen pretty much every company that we'd set out to see. We've had to turn down one company, but everything else we've managed to fit into our schedule, including some stuff we hadn't planned for, and the launch of the new 2019 Nissan Leaf E+, Plus, which is why we're here sitting on a seat outside by the strip instead of the broadcast studio that we promised you yesterday. Yes, the launch of the new Nissan Leaf was an understated affair. Pretty quiet, very staid. The new car is behind us, as you can see, and we had an interview inside, but very little else. They did give us the new specs, however. Yes, the new specs are okay. They're probably what you were expecting, a 62 kilowatt hour air-cooled battery pack, that's very important, no liquid cooling for the new Nissan Leaf E+, Plus. Uh, a range of around 226 miles per charge, which actually was quite surprising, I was expecting a slightly larger range, 100 kilowatt DC quick charging, but of course that will only work if you charge at a 100 kilowatt DC quick charging station. Indeed, but you do get slightly more horses for your money. In fact, quite a few more. You get 214 horsepower as opposed to the around 150 for the standard Nissan Leaf. And it's important to remember here that the 2018 Nissan Leaf as we know it, the one with the 40 kilowatt hour battery pack, will still continue to be sold. The Nissan Leaf E Plus is just a longer range variant of that car. The motor, yes, as Kate's just said, is more powerful, but apart from that and the new range and the slightly faster charging capability, it's basically the same car underneath. We don't have pricing yet, but when we have it, we'll let you know. So let's go back to the top of the day. I started off my day by going to BMW, where I got to commute home in a BMW Vision iNext electric car, except it wasn't the real thing. It was virtual reality. Yeah, yeah. So how was that? Actually, it's really good. BMW has a demonstration area here at CES 2019 where it's showing off what life might be like if you had an autonomous BMW electric car. So it played this virtual reality story in which I became a BMW employee heading home for the day and there was a problem with my schedule which meant that the conference call that I got planned for 6 p.m. before I left the office had to be moved. I had to take the conference call in the car on my way home while the car took care of the driving for me. The virtual digital assistant did the driving for me. I had my conference call and then I was still able to make it home in time for the football game. I see. You're a big football fan, I know. I Yeah, what? Anyway, it was really impressive and I actually enjoyed it a little bit more in some ways than the Audi Rocket Rescue that we experienced the other day because rather than be a game that you could play in the car, this virtual reality experience showed me what might happen in the future if the car is doing some of the driving for me and I can regain some of my personal time. That's something BMW is calling ease mode. So when the car is driving for you, it's called ease mode. And it's actually quite pleasant. Yep, I know it was only virtual reality, but I came out impressed. That's really interesting. And I think it's a theme that we've seen here again, which is this idea of trying to regain that time you spend commuting. And what are you gonna do with that time? Well, I don't know. I'd probably want to watch more TV and maybe read some more books. Yeah, some books. That would be nice. Anyway, after we'd done that, you went off to Intel. I did. I went to what was really a very dry presentation on the by the Intel Mobileye team. The head of Mobileye gave us an update on where they're at with their ADAS, an autonomous driving program. They're actually using the data from one program to improve the other, which is a really interesting trick. And it means that they've been advancing quite quickly. What they are saying is that they're developing a system that's entirely based on cameras with just 12 cameras and 
The LiDAR and radar sensors are purely there as a backup, as a redundant system. All of the driving is done off the 12 cameras. That's really interesting because Mobileye used to be a partner with Tesla. They used to provide the hardware that Tesla used in its first generation autopilot hardware system. And Tesla has dabbled with just using its cameras. In fact, that's Tesla's way forward, is just to use vision software rather than all of these extra sensors, because machine learning can now identify so much just from physical images. Yes, and it really sounded like they've made a lot of progress. They had some really interesting videos of cars actually on the road, driving autonomously, and what they were identifying from those vision processing tricks. Um, the one thing that was really also quite interesting is that they're using the Mobile IQ4 to feed back data. So this is very similar to what we discussed yesterday, but what they're actually doing is trying to map the world. So using the data from their cameras to identify what they call landmarks. So that can be street signs, sign lighting, anything that can be used as a landmark for the car to help it position itself. That's, that's pretty impressive. So is there any indication about what life is like for Mobileye now that it's part of Intel? A couple of years ago, Mobileye was acquired by Intel. It was originally its own startup based in Israel. I think a lot of the Israeli team are still there working on the system, but now it's part of a much larger organization, obviously Intel being a chip manufacturer. Has there been any changes because of that new acquisition? They they didn't really talk about that at all. It was really played down that they were part of Intel. All it said was an Intel company, just at the side of their name. And that was really the way they were treated, as an independent company working on their product. But yes, they're owned by Intel. And that's fairly normal in the automotive world, You're seeing lots of chip companies, lots of tech companies buying into autonomous vehicle and electric car tech and allowing those companies to remain fairly autonomous, if you'll if exclude the pun. Indeed. So while you were over at Intel, I was having fun on the Audi stand. A lot of the stuff that was being announced in the official press announcements were things that we'd already learned from a couple of nights ago. But one thing that did get my attention was the e-foil. It's a water-based transport solution that's been built originally single-handedly by one of Audi's engineers, and now it's part of Audi's portfolio moving forwards. It has a water jet that's six kilowatts in terms of power. And when you stand on the board and you squeeze the trigger, just like you would an electric skateboard, it rises out of the water and powers you along. It has a top speed of 27 miles per hour, an average speed of 18 miles per hour, all from a two kilowatt hour battery pack. That's really impressive. And they looked like a hell of a lot of fun when I saw the videos. Yep, and it was pretty lightweight as well. I can't remember the exact weight, but it was pretty impressive. Gives you about a one hour runtime. And the guy responsible for this product says he's regularly rode across lakes to go and get a coffee and then come back. He said you can charge it from the mains outlet at the moment, but hinted maybe in the future you'd be able to charge it in your car. So it would be like another mobility solution. So maybe you could commute down the Thames on one, Kate. Well, that would be a long way for me to go. Well, but you, yes. I could commute across the Puget Sound on it, and that would be quite fun. I don't know if you'd get across the Puget Sound in an hour using that device. Maybe not. I don't know if I would, I would necessarily trust it. So after all of that, we felt pretty hungry. Yeah, and I took us all out to lunch. Uh, you I... came with us to Impossible Burger. Yes, I got lunch for the whole team. So last night, there was a special event here in Vegas for Impossible Burger, which those of you who don't know, is a meat substitute, a vegetable meat burger, they like to call it. It's doesn't have any animal product in it. And it's been running now for a couple of years. I like Impossible Burgers I like because it. I'm now vegetarian. I, I eat them fairly regularly. You have them fairly yeah, regularly. I've had them quite a few times. Last night they had an official press event where they released version two of the Impossible Burger, which is completely gluten-free. Wheat-free, gluten-free. Yes. Which is great. Which is great. And it has that same kind of juicy texture. It's really nice to eat. And it reduces your carbon impact, which is something I know a lot of you are concerned about. Yep. So not necessarily electric vehicles, but carbon footprint reduction is very important to us as a team. It's one of the reasons why we drove down in our car rather than 
flu and so impossible burger 2 seemed like a great way to grab some lunch so thanks to impossible burger 2 for that we also met Louis, the guy who yeah. flew around the world. He's a really nice guy, actually. He was. So, hi, Louis. Hello. You were, you were really nice, just like he is on, on the YouTube. I fangirled just a little bit. You did a little bit. Which I don't normally do. But Fun for Louis is a great channel. If you haven't gone to it, go check it out. We'll link to it in the show notes below. And, yeah, we talked about electric vehicles and uh, had a bit of fun there. Yeah, yeah. And then we headed over to see Packard, Peterbilt, Kenworth. So Packard is the company that owns Kenworth and Peterbilt trucks. And interestingly, Kenworth is working with hydrogen, with Toyota, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. They are the company that worked on the project portal truck, the hydrogen fuel cell truck. They're building 10 hydrogen fuel cell trucks for use in the port of Los Angeles yes. to help get goods from the ports into other parts of the port or into town. And Peterbilt are working on electric trucks. Yes, they are working on a class six and a class eight truck as well as a trash truck. Now they didn't have the trash truck there. They had the, the class eight truck there. They had the class six truck there. The class eight has a standard 10 speed, uh, five, five split five yeah, transmission. It had two electric motors in series and the batteries were on the outside of the chassis rails like you might expect a fuel tank to be. Yeah. But the Class 6 was a bit different. Yeah, the Class 6, they hid the batteries within the chassis rails, which protects them somewhat, makes them easy to service still, because you can actually just lower them out, even leaving the body in place. Um, and it has a range of around 100 miles. Which is pretty impressive. It's just what you need for city deliveries, which is what they're aiming it at. And interestingly, Peterbilt is under no illusion that electric trucks are going to be much more expensive to build than diesel trucks, but seem to be very committed to making electric trucks a thing of the future. The thing that made me very interested about the Class 6 truck was it had a 140 something kilowatt hour battery pack. Yeah. Yeah. And it had CCS quick charging. Yeah, it can recharge it in an hour. Using a using compatible a, CCS yes, using quick a charging regular station. CCS. I'm assuming it's a higher power rate than you might find in a Chevrolet Bolt or a yeah. BMW i3, but it's still pretty impressive. And it means that they could make use of existing infrastructure. And that means that companies don't have to necessarily spend a lot of money buying expensive dedicated charging stations. Absolutely. And if you can use the infrastructure that's already in place, that means those trucks can travel further in the course of a day. I mean, if the truck driver is on a lunch break, they could plug in for an hour and get some of their range back. Even if they didn't get a full charge, they could still get some of their range back. So it would be great for delivery services. But to be honest, most of these last mile delivery services never do more than 100 miles in a day anyway. No. So that's it from day three of CES 2019. I know I've had fun. I think you've had some fun I too. Definitely had some fun today. And there will be more roundups coming later this week from the crew here in Vegas. I hope that you enjoyed this. If you did, give it a thumbs up, share it with your friends, hit the subscribe button, and don't forget to also tap that bell. And as soon as there's a new video up from CES 2019, you'll find out all about it. In the meantime, don't forget to switch to New Zealand's only Carbon Zero certified renewable electricity company. I'm Nikki Gordon-Bloomfield. I'm Kate Walton-Elliott. Kakite. See you next time.